Hey guys, it's Trafflton. You know, generative AI has been a big part of the tech industry for the past two years. Everything from the latest AI nonsense that OpenAI has cooked up to new competition from the Chinese company DeepSeek. Let me make a different proposal to what you might hear from a lot of more traditional tech users. We need AI. Because forget about the online crap. Here's why you need local, offline AI models to service your needs and some examples of how you might use it to augment your workflow. Now, when we talk about AI, we want AI that respects you. And the thing that I want to open with is that AI will, that respects you is AI that is open or open source. Generative AI can be a powerful tool, but there's often more to consider than just capability. For years, companies like Google and Facebook now utilize their own versions of generative AI, but they also leverage it as platforms to even further advantage themselves. The big problem with a lot of generative AI tools is that many of them are developed in secret, and we have very little knowledge of what kind of information they're trained on beyond publicly available information, whatever that means. <laughs> While AI companies are usually quick to release research papers about how amazing their AI is, reviewing the citations of said papers reveal that these papers are often pushed out with inaccurate sources and references, and it's often done to boost credibility of people who are only skimming the article, and it's also done to bypass academic peer review. <laughs> Everything you have read about AI being wrong, probably being a bubble like the dot-com bubble and generating garbage articles on the internet are all 100% true. But I would also like to suppose that, that the inverse is true as well. AI is now a means to propagate knowledge and provide new forms of accessibility that never existed before, or even empower people with skills that they may not have otherwise had and blanket statements for and against AI, whether it's from your local tech bro or from the old man crying in Stallman's basement, don't have accomplished anything. Because the real tangible problem with AI is it doesn't have a use case for an individual who is not in academia or doing real work. Do you want to get some code quickly written? Do you want to proofread a document? You want to answer a question on your math homework? AI has you covered. But if you want to generate an image or write an essay, forget about it. It's not going to help you. The other thing to be aware of is the hardware required to run many of these models. I've done review on my own personal computer before, and my computer has a high-end NVIDIA card. And running some AI is no problem, but it's incredibly power-intensive, and it largely favors NVIDIA hardware. The newcomer DeepSeek may advertise itself as an offline chat GPT, but what they don't tell you is that they require over 400 gigabytes of storage as a left arm offering to operate in addition to their steep GPU requirements, the right arm offering. <laughs> But the last thing to be aware of is AI is rapidly changing and advancements are made all the time. There is a high probability the things that you will hear from me will be completely outdated within a year or two. But I wanna get down to the bare basics. Core program that we're going to focus on is a program called Olama. Now this is where the complications come in because Olama is installed differently depending on which operating system you use. On Windows and Mac, there's tray icon support, and it lets you know if Olama's running or not. Now, if you're bummed out about that disparity, just know that on Linux, you get a graphical program called Alpaca, made by Jeff Samuel, which automates the installation through Flatpak. You can pick and choose whichever models you want. And if you're using Linux or Windows specifically and are interested more with what Olama can do with the command line or even just spinning up your own Olama server you can access remotely, you can also run the official Docker container. And this is actually what I do. So whether you are running Windows, Mac, or Linux, you will need to run the Olama server on your device after running the installer just to make sure that your AI chat will work. And you are going to need to do this even if you use a front-end program like Alpaca or if you want to use something like Brave's built-in integration, for example. 
So after you install a llama, the first thing you need to do is you need to open the Windows terminal, the Apple terminal, or the terminal in your Linux distribution, and you're going to run the command olama serve. What this is going to do is it's going to start the olama server. And from here, what we can do is we can run various commands to interface with olama. If you want to install a new AI model, what you can do is you can run olama pull and then the name of your AI model. And if you want to run a model and also install it if it's not available, you can run the command olama run name of model. And if you'd like to see all the models you currently have installed, you can run an olama list. And if you want to remove a model, it's an olama rm. We've gone through the trouble to install Olama, and we've gone through the trouble of installing gigabytes of AI models onto our machines. But this begs the question, what in the world am I going to use this AI for? Trappleton, it's hard work. I store video games, I have family photos on my computer, I have terabytes of anime on my computer. I have limited space. How am I going to make best use of the storage in the AI models that I use? What AI model should I even use? And I want to break this up into a few categories and then some bare bones blanket recommendations. Especially when it comes to general purpose models, you can consolidate this so you don't have to go download every single AI model on the planet. Just pick and choose what you want with what you are comfortable with and what you think would serve you the best. The first major use case for AI is real world answers. And this is often where you'd ask questions that you would normally ask for a search engine. Like if you wanted to ask the AI, what's the capital of Assyria? I think that's a plain fact, unless you saw the Monty Python movie. <laughs> and the benefit of this is you don't need to involve a third party service. You don't need to ask another search engine. You don't need to ask an AI on the internet. All of it's done on your device and doesn't involve anybody else. The downside is that you might have to fact check the information the AI tells you, because despite all the advancement in the last couple years, AI is not perfect. Now, the other thing is image description, and this is really useful for people who need to generate alt text if you're a web developer or for people who have visual impairments. You can just drag and drop an image into your terminal and have an AI describe it for you or even transcribe text in it. The one caveat I have to this, it is tends to be very prone to error, so be prepared to actually look and see the results. Uh, as of writing this now, I feel like the best one is Facebook's Llama, because it has a special vision model that's like 9 gigabytes large, and sometimes even bigger, but it is very capable at looking and describing at many types of images. <laughs> then we have Mathematics. And I am willing to admit that I am not an expert in algebra or calculus or even just general finance. But the benefit of having an AI do it means they can do all of the work while you can just sit back and relax. The problem with a lot of math and AI is that math and AI tends not to be perfect. What ends up happening usually is they're usually very language based, but not very mathematically based. So you often need to download a more specialized model. This is stuff like Mathstroll, Phi 3.5, or even something like Quen. The, I found the best way to actually word your prompts is actually either like equations, like the way calculators perceive equations or in word problems. And AI is actually pretty good at answering these questions. Now, the obvious one for a lot of people I'm sure are screaming already is coding. If you're a programmer or a server maintainer, AI can save you the headache of trying to search forms and documentations and wikis. Results may vary, of course, so don't blindly ship the code that the AI gives you, but test and run it, and it can also be a great way to experience programming languages or give you knowledge about computers or things that you may not have otherwise known. For example, I've been trying to migrate myself away from just running Nginx on bare metal to running it in a Docker container. And AI has actually proven very, very helpful for this. Now, the downside of coding AIs is they may not necessarily know technologies that are newer than the information the AI was trained on. And the final thing is proofreading and summarization. If you're a writer or a content creator and you'd like to have your work reviewed, Here's an idea, feed your script into an AI and get it proofed. Have it provide counter arguments. It could even correct grammar of your article. These are all great ways to have AI augment your writing rather than replace it. 
it's making you a better writer and it makes higher quality content for you to produce. And for those of you who are still skeptical, let me posit the ethical moral to you. If you don't support open source AI, you are allowing companies like OpenAI, Claude, and Perplexity to dominate the conversation and it's going to lock users in and give them no freedom at all and trap them in like every other business that came before. If we support open source projects like open source AI, that means there's more benefits for everyone. <laughs> So if you're interested, my other thoughts about AI, I have written about it last year. And all this being said, if you want to support open source software, you need to support and welcome and use open source AI just like it is software. With all that being said, this, this is what generative AI is. Here's how you can use it ethically and morally. Here's how you can run it on your own device. And here's some ways that it can actually go and serve you. So if you liked this video, why don't you go leave a like on this video? <laughs> leave a like on this video. If you'd like to hear me complain about Docker, Boy, oh boy, do I have some things to say about Docker. I hate it so much, but I probably hate Debian way more. And if you're interested in the work that I do, you can also get a full transcript of everything that you have seen in this video on my website, trapleton.com. Not only is it a full transcript, you can also copy paste some of the commands that I have and see some of the sources and music used in this video. And if you'd like to support the work that I do, you can always support me through Patreon, YouTube memberships, or cryptocurrency. So thank you all for watching. I will see you all later. And wouldn't it be great if I just revealed that this was an AI voice the whole time and not me recording in the middle of my bedroom?